Good afternoon and welcome back to the Pure Mix live stream extravaganza. That's not how you say it. Extravaganza, extravaganza. Uh, madness. Madness is what I meant. Um, and today what we're going to do is we're going to uh, break down the mix uh, portion of the tracks of my tears. Universal Audio um, Madness. Um, if you are a Pure Mix member, you've seen the making of. Um, if you're not a Pure Mix member, uh, you should be, but you can watch the end result here on YouTube, heard of it, uh, and I'm going to play a few seconds of it so you have some context, and then we're going to look into how it was done on the mix side for the making of side. I mentioned the Pure Mix stuff. Here we go. music. So uh, let me give you some context. Um, the context was uh, my good friends at Neuros Audio called and said, hey, um, the, the Motown reverb is coming out. Uh, we'd love to do like a, you know, a piece to, to show it off. I'm like, oh yeah, that, that's, that's great. Um, and um, so I called Lewis because, well, you know why now, you just heard it. Uh, and so um, in the process of that, it turned out that their modeling microphones was also coming out more or less at the same time. So they sent me a box of these modeling microphones, which I had never used before. Uh, and um, I literally start, started using them on the day of the shoot. All this was done 100% live. There was no, um, there's like no smoke, no mirrors. And it was tracked in, behind this wall in the Dangerous Room at Flux Studios, all in one take. So what I'm going to do today for the mix side of things is actually going to show you a little bit behind the scenes what happened after the shoot. Because the mix that you hear here uh, on this final video is actually not the first mix I made. There was another mix before. And I'm going to tell you how that went down. So first, I'm going to show you the Luna session right here. Oh, by the way, today is a, um, because I'm not mixing from scratch, I'm actually showing you uh, the end result. Um, I'll have more time for questions. So if you have questions, put them in the chat. And Tom, who's in the back over there, will uh, shout them at me uh, so that um, I can answer them live on the tube. So we went with take four. As you can see, there were seven takes. And, um, and we went with take four. And this is the raw session. So as you can see, this is what I was I ended up with at the end of the tracking session. So you did the cues are still in there. And uh, as you can see, some of the microphone have already modeling on them. And I was able to do that because it's real time, right? So there's no latency. So I'm able to track through the microphone modeling system. Uh, obviously, that's the principle of that. And then I already have the chamber here. And the chamber was there um, to give the musicians the vibe. I didn't know if I was going to keep this version of the chamber, but I definitely you know, was going to use the chamber since that was the whole purpose. Uh, and it sounded like this. Let me, there's a false start here. And then there's, what is this? One more time, one more time. Apparently one more time. Here, take four. I'm the life of the party girls 
I tell a joke or two. Okay, cool. So, um, things you didn't see um, in the video uh, is that there was one microphone that was not an original um, UA muddy microphone. It was, sorry, there was not a UA muddy microphone. It was an actual original um, Electro Voice 666, which, because before doing all this madness, I made a couple calls. Um, and I called people who were actually in the room where those records were made. Um, I called um, Dave Isaac and I called Bob Olson. And, um, and I picked their brain and said, hey, how did you make this and, and this stuff? And where were your habits and where were the problems? And, uh, you know, and I learned a lot from that. I knew quite a bit because I didn't tell him, but I love this stuff. So I actually knew a lot of stuff, but I learned still more. And one of the things that Bob told me is that they would use an Electro Voice 666 on the bass drum. So I called Vance Powell and I said, yo, Vance, I know you have one. Can you send, can you send it to me? So he did. And I put it on. And um, I ended up not using it. I used the uh, modding microphone, which uh, was the LX, and I used a 77 uh, model on it. But um, this is what the 666 sounded like. Let me go. And then this is what the bass drum sounded like. 27. Without the modeling. Modeling again. And of course you hear the um, the bleed from the horns because everything was in one room except for Lewis, which was in the booth. So um, this is what I started with at the end of the session. You may notice here, let me see, is it on this session? No, this is the actual full raw session. So there's no horn overdub. There was one horn overdub. There was a tambourine overdub and I replaced one word or one small phrase of Lewis's lead vocal from another take. Um, so we finished the, the, the take, um, everybody was happy, the video people went back and did their video thing, and I was supposed to mix it. And so I started mixing it, and the idea for me was to make it as pristine as possible, right? Um, the original brief was like, let's not, let's not be uh, obsessive about the sound like stuff. The, the reverb would take care of that just make it sound great. I'm like, okay, cool. So I set out to do something and it's named differently now because of what I'm about to tell you, but it's named 2022. So uh, this one says, use me, use me. I think I'm going to use that one. So I'm going to open that mix and show you where I was after um, a few hours of mixing. So again, the idea was to use minimal processing to show off the reverb, and to show off the microphones, and also to show off the fact that back in the day, they didn't have a lot of processing. And although we're not doing a sound alike, we're trying to respect you know, the legacy. So it turned out to be like this. So this is this mix uh, you haven't heard, because this mix never saw the light of day. Uh, I'm going to play it for you. There you go. So you'll notice that it's basically exactly the same thing, but now we have a horn overdub. And we have a tambourine overdub, which is right here. And this is a version 1.5, so I did five revisions. Let me fold this. By the way, the organ here was on this session was done with the U80 Waterfall, which is in Spark now. So, and it's an awesome sounding organ. All right, so it sounded, my first vision on this sounded like this. I tell a joke or two Although I might be laughing loud and hearty Deep inside I'm blue So take a good look at my face you see my smile looks out of place If you look closer it's easy to trace the tracks of All 
right. So vast improvement over the raw session. Let's look a little bit at what I had done. Uh, I had basically kept everything almost the same. I changed the reverb. The first thing I did is I uh, worked on the reverb. Let me open it so you can see it. Um, and I moved the microphones further away from the speakers. Um, and I, um, I think at that point, yeah, I just put the microphones as far away from the speakers and moved the pre-delay pre back a little bit to try and get more space. Because, check this out, if you play the song and mute the reverb, this is what happens. Tell a joke or two Although I might be laughing aloud Just one reverb. It's basically the record, right? If you remove the reverb, everything feels so drab. Um, so I worked on that for a while to get a vibe that would match the original Tracks of My Tears vibe, vibe-wise, and then I fed stuff into it before I did anything else. So as you can see, almost everything goes into the reverb except the bass. Um, not that I would shy away from putting uh, bass into a reverb, but uh, it, it didn't feel right for that. The only other reverb on here is actually the organ. And I'm not using it to, um, to make it wet. I'm using it to pushing it back in the room. So I'm going to solo the organ and show you. You can hear the Leslie. Let me find a spot where he actually plays. So this is the organ reverb, and it's not really a reverb, but it's, as I said, it's a space. Let me, uh, let me show you the in button is here. Um, this, well, it's clearly obvious. So this is uh, with. Without. So it brings the whole thing super forward, right? And in the song, it actually doesn't work as well. So this is in the song without the reverb. So take a good look at my face. You see my smile looks out of place. And this is where. So take a good look at my face. You see my smile looks out of place. So Lewis is here, the organ is here. If I remove the reverb, Lewis is here, the organ is here, and it's crowding him. So adding this space, not really a reverb, this space that I use the Motown for, allows me to separate the two and put them in their own spaces. And that's it. Everything else on this mix, there's no, um, there are no EQs. Uh, I felt like I needed to soften the, the sound um, of everything, um, so I put a 250 on everything. 250 tape on the 800, I'm sorry, that's my shortcut. Put a 250 on it, Let's put the 800 with the 250 tape on it. Except, if I remember well, on Lewis, where I put a 456 tape, which is a brighter formulation, so I could bring Lewis forward. So, um, this is what this would sound like with and without the tape. It's gonna be more subtle than what you just heard, but I think it's interesting, check it out. I'm gonna go to the first verse, here. People say I'm the life of the party cuz I tell a joke or two with the river with all the tape off uh, oops it'd be better if the selection group was on People say I'm the life of the party cuz I tell a joke or two oh. So that sounds pristine right it sounds incredibly like touchable but I didn't feel that I was the vibe. I felt like it needed to be softened and um, glossed a little bit. And so again, I'm gonna play it without, and then I'm gonna play the exact same two bars or four bars with. People say I'm the life of the party cause I tell a joke or two. Although I'm... People say I'm the life of the party cause I tell a joke or two. So it's subtle, uh, but 
these kinds of stuff happens in installments, meaning you don't, you know, it's not one move, except for the reverb, one move is not going to change everything. It's little touches that make everything a little bit better. So let's observe uh, what I did for the uh, drums, because I've got a lot of questions on that. So I got rid of the EV and I uh, kept the LX and I kept a 77 on it. And then on the overhead, and this is, this, this is pretty crucial compared to our end result, which I'll show you in a second. Um, so I found this 67 sounded great. Let's go and listen to that. That noise you hear, by the way, is the, uh, the sound of the Leslie engine. Of course, you're going to want to hear without the modeling. So this is the raw microphone, just the, the normal capsule, normal electronics of the uh, LX and the DLX, and then I'll turn the modeling back on. That sounds great. Here's with the modeling. Gentler, softer, um, and more saturation on the transients, which is the right vibe for this. So I went with that, and I was happy with that, and then I moved on. Moved on. For the tambourine overdub, um, there was a sense in, at the time that it felt very bright. So if I go where he's jamming, like here. Um, if I remove the modeling. You hear that e thing every time he hits it. With the uh, uh, for the forty thirty eight, obviously much darker. And what I'm doing here is I'm actually using the modeling thing to make it completely off axis and as far away as I, as the modeling will let me do. If I left it uh, stock, it would sound like this. And then I moved it away. Much gentler transients. So that was my decision there. And then bass I didn't touch, guitar didn't touch, I just put the tape on it. The organ, um, I believe I tracked through the 610 to uh, give it more saturation. And then I put the reverb I showed you. And the trumpets. So the trumpets are, um, sorry, wrong button. I'm a professional, don't try this at home, folks. Let's listen to the horns uh, solo. This is what they sounded like with just a raw microphone. So the microphone sounds great raw, but with the modeling, I chose a 44 because that's what the Geneva Convention says you should use on horns, at least bright horns. Um, so I did this. These are the four 44s. And you'll notice what I did um, is the first take I moved, which is on the left here, I uh, put it off axis and as far away as possible. And then the second take, because I had moved the microphones, already far away for the for the overdub, I didn't do that. And that creates the sound. So again, with that once. Sounds more like a record. It's more, it's further away. It, that's what I needed. Uh, that model is bananas. Um, and then there's the vocal. So when I had talked to Bob Olson, who is an unbelievable engineer and who was there for a lot of 
my favorite Motown tracks, if I want to be selfish about this. So it was kind of a, it was like a real, real treat to be able to talk to him. Uh, we have an awesome um, Zoom with him on the on the Pyramix video on the making of this. He told me, I said, oh no, we used, we used parallel processing. I was like, what? Um, so he told me that they would run the, uh, the lead vocal into uh, a Fairchild in parallel. And I was like, hmm, don't you say? So I did the same thing. Um, I used uh, the Bill Putnam 67 model on, on Lewis and I looked while I was tracking, I think I looked for a few models and that's the one that I felt was great. Um, and, um, but something happened because usually when you do a session like this, you don't have any time to experiment with much because you have five guys, they're on the clock, there's a video dude, actually there were like five or six video dudes, everything is running crazy, everybody's late, some people are early, it's a mess, right? So if you, you and you're not the guy who's going to sit in a chair and say, uh, excuse me guys, um, I'd like to do uh, four bars with every pattern on the microphone because I just want to make absolutely sure that you're supposed to know that, right? But because over time, because there's time pressure, you fall into habits. And so I know that when I have a vocalist in my booth in the dancer's room and I put a 67 in front of him uh, and I put it in cardio, I know it sounds bananas. Great. When was the last time when I had time to, sit, to be there and say, you know, how about I try something outlandish and see if it works? Basically never. In this case, um, I didn't have the pressure of people because I was able to do this post because everybody was gone. And because of the, the modeling stuff, I'm able to actually change the pattern and the proximity to some extent in post. So that's when I discovered that in my booth, in that position, which is our standard position for putting the microphone, this is what the vocal sound, and I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to bypass everything else so you can really focus on what's going on because this was kind of like a, a moment for me. Uh, so I'm going to share with you. Go to the beginning of where Louis sings. Check this out. So I tracked it like this. People say I'm the life of the party because I tell a joke or two. That's what I'm used to do. Um, that's what um, conventional wisdom says you should do. Put the 67 or whatever microphone you do in, um, in cardio and move on. The reason for that is if you put in an omni in a small room, it sounds like this. People say I'm the life of the party because I tell a joke or two. And so you hear a lot more of the room grabbing. Like for example, when he says people say, you can hear the room going, whoa. People say I'm the life. And of course, in, um, in cardio, and here I was using subcardio for some reason, in subcardio, um, you don't hear as much. People say I'm the life of the party cause I... So I was all by my lonesome mixing this and I think, well, this, this stuff is, is cool. I never had a modeling microphone before. Um, what would happen if I, if I put it in figure eight? And check this out. People say I'm the life of the party cause I tell a joke or two. Sounds bananas. And the reason for that, I think, is because the left side of the booth is all glass so that people can see each other while they play, which is more important to me. The comfort of the musicians is more important than in the 5 or 10 or 15 percent of the sound quality that you lose by having the reflection. But putting in a figure eight, considering where the microphone was, the null part of the figure eight basically canceled a lot of the glass reception, the reflections. And so I was able to um, get the sound to go from here People say I'm the life of the party cause I tell a joke or two. To hear. People say I'm the life of the party cause I tell a joke or two. So I was able to move him forward into the mix without touching any of the proximity stuff or access stuff just by using a pattern that killed some of the reflections in the room. I felt very proud of myself for that. Um, and, um, and no EQ. As you notice on this mix, there are no EQs. There's only one EQ on the mix bus, which I'm going to show you in a second. Um, turn this back on, turn this back on, and turn the parallel. So this is without the parallel. People say I'm the life of the party because I tell a joke or two. And then I'm going to show you the settings on the parallel and turn it on. 
People say I'm the life of the party cuz I tell a joke or two. Context. People say I'm the life of the party cuz I tell a joke or two. Oh. Awesome. Um, so I was, you know, satisfied with that. On the mix bus, I have a fair child because Bob, both uh, Bob and Dave Isaac, who I also talked to, uh, talk to, told me, yep, yeah, yeah we, we use Fairchild sometimes on Mixbus. And then I used this because it was available and because I wanted the thing to sound fat, which is a technical term. Um, so the Fairchild does this. People say I'm the life of the party cause I tell a joke or two. Basically nothing, but if you remove it, People say I'm the life of the party cause I tell a joke or two. Listen to the bass drum connected to the bass and listen to the bottom of the vocal. Check it out without. People say I'm the life of the party cause I tell a joke or two. With. People say I'm the life of the party cause I tell a joke or two. Transformers are your friends. Tubes too. Um, so, Hitsville. What I'm doing here with the Hitsville is I am removing a little bit of the sheetrock sound at 320 and adding a little bit of 50 and a little bit of 30. Without it, it sounds like this. People say I'm the life of the party cause I tell a joke or two. With. People say I'm the life of the party cause I tell a joke or two. Just a little fatter. You hear the bass drum come through, uh, the bass a little more forward, and a little bit of um, cleanup in in the in this area. Check it out. People say I'm the life of the party cause I tell a joke or two. Without the cleanup. People say I'm the life of the party. Listen to people say I'm the. People say I'm the. You hear a little bit of a a grab, what I call a grab. It, just, it feels like it's moving forward a little bit. Just one dB less at 320. People say I'm the life of the party. Way smoother. Um, and then an ATR, um, because that's my thing. And uh, it's actually recently been my thing. Probably in the last year or so, I used to use the 800 a lot, and I could not use the ATR. I just could not get it to sound good to my taste. And then one day, I don't remember which record, I just had a click and I was like, I wasn't happy with the 800 and I wanted to soften the stuff up. I said, ah, let's just try the ATR again. Despair, that moment of despair was like, I'll try, what else do you have? I put it on and I played with it and I was like, oh, it's working. And either it was a difference in my consciousness on how to use it or it was a difference uh, maybe in gain staging in that particular session. And since then, I pretty much have this ATR on all my all my mix buses. So this is the song, the top of the song without the ATR, and then I'll turn it on the same bars again so you can have the, the sound in your head. People say I'm the life of the party cause I tell a joke or two. People say I'm the life of the party cause I tell a joke or two. I apologize for the difference in level. This is bad form for me. I don't know it was, why it was that way. I'm usually pretty obsessive about matching uh, pre-post. I didn't on this, and I don't want to change it because I don't want to, um, you know what? Screw it. Technical term. Let me, let me level match. People say I'm the life of the party cause I tell a joke or two. About two dBs. People say I'm the life of the party. Good enough for rock and roll. Folk and roll. Mot and roll. Here we go. Without. People say I'm the life of the party cause I tell a joke or two. With. People say I'm the life of the party cause I tell a joke or two. So I biased it so it gets um, you know more present and more open and a little brighter. And but it really softens everything. I really dig this thing. And then because it was 2022 at the time, a limiter um, to bring it up to you know 
uh, the obscene, closer to the obscene levels that we practice these days. People say I'm the life of the party cause I tell a joke or two. As you can see on Decibel right here, that's the only, uh, only modern you know, emulation plugin here is the limiter in Decibel. And uh, I actually was shooting for a Spotify level, like minus, I think the average is 14, which is Spotify level, um, throughout the song. I was like, there's no need to crush this, um, but we can bring it up to, you know, a more modern stuff. So if this ends up on, on Spotify, you'll put it in all sound bananas as is. They actually ended up uh, mastering the song, but that's for the next part of this program. So that's how I mix that. And um, it seems like nothing, but actually um, refraining from using any compression in EQ was actually a new brain because after you know, mixing every day, nonstop for uh, many years, you just have your own systems. And so I hear a vocal that's a little this, I'm like, oh, poof, done. I don't even think about what I'm doing, it just happens. So here I had to think, it's like, okay, well, how about we use the, uh, the patterns on the microphones and we use different kinds of microphones like Al Schmidt would have done um, because he knew better. And um, instead of just reaching for compressors and EQs. And it was actually a super, super interesting uh, process for me. And so um, I mixed this. I don't remember how long it took me, a few hours probably. And I was um, pretty obsessive about it because it's a, it's a big responsibility. It's a new product. And, um, and I wasn't 100% familiar with it, so I tried everything to make sure I really had the, the thing in, in my fingers and in my brain. And then, um, and then I sent it to Lewis. Uh, it's always good to, uh, to get feedback. And uh, I took the liberty to write, to uh, screenshot our text exchange. So I sent it to him, and this is the 2022 feedback. And then it's here. I hope you can see it. Let me see if I can scale it up. And it's, okay. So Louis says, listen twice, check in reference to make sure I'm hearing what I think I'm hearing. Uh-oh. Basically, vocal sounds like it's missing air or sheen. The track sounds beautiful, man. So I went back, and I didn't even answer that. I went back and did some work, and I said, new one's up. He answers, all good, checking now. Way better to my ears. Okay. I'm going to let this sit to an hour and send it, send it to the Universal Audio folks, um, unless you have other reservations. Awesome, I'm good with that. Uh, I, I would just pass the bridge. It wasn't on a bridge. It was actually listening to the song and giving the feedback in real time. Uh, we leave a message if something else jumps out. So, track sounds beautiful, all good, way better to my ears. I'm good with that. That, my friends, is what I call utmost failure. That is not the feedback from an artist who is really happy with the mix. That's a uh, polite feedback from a professional who, um, who knows that in certain situations you can always get what you want, like the Stone said, uh, and that you know you have to work with the team and everything. And I, I'm, I, I was like, ah, I, don't, I don't want feedback like that. That's not what I want. So I, um, I slept on it. I didn't send it in. I slept on it. And then, then I sent it in. I sent it in to Ben, sent it to Erica. And, and I was like, OK, guys, this is the thing. And everybody liked it. And they used it uh, for a bunch of stuff. But it didn't sit well with me. And, um, and I said, you know what? Screw this. Uh, let's do something else. And I said, let's. I went back and listened to the to to the original version of the smoky version of the song. And the smoky version of the song is 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 it distorts, uh, it's bright, and and it's awesome. And so uh, I was like, Ugh, let me try something. And so I um, started a new version, which I call 1967. And I'm going to switch to the final of 1967. And I'm going to show you what I did differently. So pay attention to the screen. It's uh, unloading this session and loading the next session. Not a lot of difference. What's different? Well, first, the way it sounds. Let's go back to the top. Sorry, I gypped you on the pickup. I'm the life of the party girls. 
So in theory, a purist would say it doesn't sound as good. Um, it's not as hi-fi and the instruments are not as defined and stuff like that. However, so I did this, took me a little while, and let me see you, I'll show you the feedback that I got from Lewis when I sent it to Lewis. This is what I got. Dude, this is the vibe. This sounds like the idea I had in my head when I was arranging and then performing it. Dude, yes, 100, 100, 100, this is fucking it. That's the feedback you want from the people you work with. This shows emotion, so they had an emotion connection to this that it didn't have to the other. So my intuition was right, is that it was, the other one was worked and it was fine, it was professional and it sounded good and it showed off what it was supposed to show off, which means it was supposed to show off the reverb, the microphones, um, the, the song, the performance, everything was well represented, but it wasn't, it didn't have the vibe. So this is the difference between the two mixes. The first thing I did is I looked into the drums. I was like, I made a good sound, a drum sound, but I didn't make a, a drum sound that, that was connected to the, to the song. And so to do so, what I did is I changed my approach a little bit. First, I put the drums on the left. Way better. And I kept the 77 on the, on the bass drum, and I kept the 67 on the, on the drum, on the overhead, the single overhead, but I changed the pattern. Let me show you, I took screenshots for you because that's the kind of girl I am. This is the 2022, and the 2022 uh, overhead was in uh, subcardio, and here it's in figure eight. Check it out. So this is the overhead, just the overhead, um, in the original subcardio. This is in figure eight. So what it's doing is it allows me to get rid of a lot more horns and to make it sound thinner. And I also uh, put it a little bit um, off axis and uh, a little, you know, use the modeling to make it feel like it was a little further away from the drum. And so that allowed me to put the drums on the left and the horns on the right because it was so much less bleed of the horns into the overhead uh, using the figure eight because it was this way and the null was pointing towards the horns, which was, may have been planned. Um, so the, the idea here is that um, by using the pattern in post, I was able to separate the drums more, which allowed me to put them on the left, which is more reminiscent of the vibe you got from those records from the late 60s. So I did that, and that changed everything. The other thing I did is I switched all the um, A100s for ATR-102s. And I used the uh, quarter inch and 111 formulation and I hit it hard at plus nine, and it made a big difference in the saturation. Check it out. Without. So it really changed the whole complexion of the sound and made it fit, uh, sound uh, more aggressive and brighter because it's an older tape formulation um, and it's hit pretty hard. So I used that basically to get my color and still no EQs. Um, for the tambourine, if you remember, uh, I felt like it was uh, too bright. So I used a uh, 4038. And in this case, in this context, it seemed to me that that no longer worked. So I switched to a BP67, which is the Bill Putnam 67 collection, and I used it in Omni, and it sounds like this. 
Let's go to the place where it is jamming. As a reminder, this is without the modeling. With. Also put in 100%, 180% off access and move the proximity minus 100% to try and distance myself from this instrument and you too. Um, so that happened. Next, I put a compressor on the guitar and I know that, um, I mean, Bob, neither Bob nor Dave, uh, Bob Olson or Dave Isaac uh, said, oh, we use compressors on guitars. And I was like, well, you know what? At this point, um, I don't care um, if I'm not 100% accurate. Um, I just want to feel a certain way, so uh, this is what I did. Without. With. So, we use a DI, and uh, because Bob and Dave said, yeah, guitar and bass direct, um, but I'm basically hitting hard into the Fairchild to soften those transients and uh, to get, so that's why the, the gain is so high, and then, um, you know, with a really high threshold to, to really make it more even, because that is, um, that is the backbone of the pocket, and he's playing and singing at the same time, so I wanted to make sure that I had a really solid thing under his vocal, so that's different. The organ, I changed nothing except I switched from the 800 to the 102, and uh, it's the same trick to um, pr provide distance, so it's not so present. The horns, same thing, um, as I'm going to put them in the same place. So there's, uh, there you go, two, where is it? Here, here, and here. I kept the 44s. The only thing I did different is um, I think I played with the proximity so that um, I pushed everything further back. I even have the proximity um, away on one of those horns that I tracked far away. So, and that's it, otherwise the same stuff. But I grouped them, I put them in a uh, bus, and I hit them with a Fairchild. Without the Fairchild. Ah. Same thing. I, I went super hard into the, the Fairchild to be able to get more saturation from the mod, uh, modeling of the transformers and the tubes. So I'm not able to give you a real A, B. Let me see. Obviously smoother and also thicker and more connected. I think it was around here. I hope it was around here. Uh, and then on the vocal. So on the vocal, um, I got rid of the um, the parallel compression because it felt too much. And if I listen to the original Smokey version and also um, uh, Ain't No Mountain High and, and that era stuff, the vocals felt uh, centered, but they didn't feel like in your face. They felt as part of the landscape. So I decided, you know what, let's do that and see if it works. And uh, considering on the, and, and uh, side note, when I got uh, Lewis's feedback on the first version, when he said that the vocal felt d um, a little dull or not bright enough, I was like, I, I, every time I, I, I was like, I put an EQ in and I tried brightness, oh, I don't like this. So it was a context thing, context thing. And it was, it wasn't really like a brightness thing. It was more like, an approach to the entire thing that just didn't gel with him. So uh, what I did is, um, as I said earlier, I still use the BP67, I really love this model. I push him back off axis to try and soften things, um, and uh, I've moved the proximity uh, away. And then 
I kept the 800, but I switched him to a 250 because it was too bright now. And I used the Hitsville and I removed a little bit of 800 and I gotta show you what that does. And then I put the, the 660 in line. That was, the, that was the change. Let me have all the plugins up like this. These are big plugins. Um, so this is what the vocal sounds like. Let me find a spot where he's singing his ass off, which is pretty much everywhere. Hold on. Uh, yeah, we have to work with a, you know, a screen that has the resolution from 1968 to be able to have this on a live stream. And it's very hard here. Since you left me, if you see me with another girl, seeming like I'm having fun. So, um, back to the mixing board. If I get rid of everything but the microphone, it sounds like this. I'll, I'll turn the reverb off too. Since you left me, if you see me with another girl, seeming like I'm having fun. Oh. Uh, the tape to soften it and thicken it a little bit. Since you left me, if you see me with another girl, seeming like I'm having fun. Oh. The EQ. Since you left me, if you see me with another girl, seeming like I'm having fun. Let me show you what I'm removing with the 800. This is the stuff I didn't like. Since you left me, if you see me with another girl, seeming like I'm having fun. Got it? And then the fair child. Since you left me, if you see me with another girl, seeming like I'm having fun. That's a lot more compression than I usually use on anything. Uh, but since there's uh, no parallel compression anywhere on this, and basically no EQ, um, I, had to, um, I had to find a way to stabilize this. And I, I was asking myself, did I automate the hell out of this or no? Let's find out. Uh, yes, I did. Um, so I, um, I basically maybe have overcompressed a little bit, but then I rode, so it gave me a very solid picture, and then I, I just rode it, just like I rode the horns with a fader, and um, using these these guys, the um, the S ones that work great with Luna, and um, and that's how I got the vocal sound. The reverb is the same. I didn't change it from the first version because everybody agreed that it was bananas. And so um, I kept it that way. And then the mix bus. So on the mix bus, uh, let me check. This is ringing off the hook. Uh, oh, well, that's an interesting thing. Very interesting thing. Um, this is going to be fun. Uh, so on the mix bus for this version, um, I have the Fairchild, I have the EQ, but you'll notice that in the past I added bass. Here I'm removing a dB at 50 Hz and I'm still removing a dB at 320. On the Fairchild, same thing, I'm hitting it super hard to be able to get that saturation. I have the ATR, but check this out. I'm using a formulation called 3590 that I, I don't even know about, and I'm using quarter inch, and that made a world of difference that really created a super, well, a more vintage vibe. Um, and then I felt like it was too clean still, so I added uh, this tube uh, line amp, and um, I hit it pretty hard to get a little bit of the saturation, not as much saturation as the original stuff, because without the context, it would be kind of weird, but quite a bit of saturation. And then the limiter, but notice that the limiter has no gain. It's just there to make sure I'm not clipping. And that's it. Um, so let's listen to uh, the different parts of the mix bus. I don't know if it's probably going to be hard to gain stage, but I'll do my best. Uh, this is raw. Let's go back, uh, say, here. People say. Oh, maybe the whole song. Let's just do everybody. Everybody now with the reverb. People say I'm the life of the party. I tell a joke or two. Uh, with a fair child. This thing is amazing because if you have, I don't know how to explain, this is the way I think about it. 
If you have um, a, a, a mix that sounds, this sounds good to me. People say I'm the life of the party cause I tell a joke or two. But things feel a little bit discreet, not discreet as in shy, but discreet as in separated. Uh, but if I turn the Fairchild on, things tend to glue more together because of the effect of the circuitry, even though I'm not compressing a lot. People say I'm the life of the party Gain is, is louder, but let's, let's go that way. People say I'm the life of the Without. People say I'm the life of the party cause I tell a joke or two. People say I'm the life of the party cause I tell a joke or two. Way more together, right? So, I mean, maybe way more is exaggerated, but feels more together to me. Uh, and then the EQ. So this is without. People say I'm the life of the party cause I tell a joke or with. People say I'm the life of the party cause I tell a joke or Notice right away that the vocal feels brighter and everything feels shifted up just because I have minus one dB at 50 hertz and one, minus one dB at 320. The minus one dB at 320 is cleaning the bottom of the vocal and the mass, minus one dB at 50 hertz is making that uh, bass drum sound less forward and less modern and more, you know, agnostic time-wise. Um, you may have noticed that over the course of the years and the decades, drums are sounding less and less like drums. They sound more and more like bombs um, or uh, slaps in the face. Uh, back in the day, and when this music was, um, uh, when they emoted this kind of music, they, they, the drum was in the room, and whatever the drum sounded like is what it sounded on the record. Uh, with a little bit of EQ maybe, uh, or some microphone plays, but more, you know, it's two microphones. What else are you going to do? Uh, and so there's not all the parallel compression and compression and all the like oomph that makes it sound like, right? So I felt like I had to have more of that. And because I felt it was still a little too hi-fi, so I took a dB down uh, in the sub and it, it did the trick. Um, so this is where we are. People say I'm the life of the party because I tell a joke or two. And now with the tape. People say I'm the life of the party. Let me level match for a second. People say I'm the life of the party. One more time, without. People say I'm the life of the party cause I tell a joke or two. With. People say I'm the life of the party cause I tell a joke or two. It's that compression that's not compression and that extra little sizzle. It's just another together thing. I'm putting the level back so as to not ruin the gain stage into the next thingy. Uh, the next thingy is this thingy. So we were here. People say I'm the life of the party cause I tell a joke or two. Although I might be laughing loud and hearty, deep inside I'm blue. With. People say I'm the life of the party cause I tell a joke or two. Although I might be... This shines really when it gets loud. You saw me do in um, in out up here, right? It's a little bit extra edge, like a little bit of you know that sound. Um, and uh, yeah, I absolutely. Um, what happened there is I listened to it. Um, actually, I sent it to Lewis. I got the feedback that you read, and I was like, hmm, okay, so I'm on the right track. And then I listened to it in a lot of places on uh, earbuds. And I tried to imagine what it would feel like with the picture, and it felt still a little too now.
So with just a smidgen more edge there, then it felt more um, out of time. Not 1967, not 2022, not 2023. It just felt it's like its own thing. It has a little bit more grit. It's a little less polite. And so I put it in and I was like, I hope this goes. And it went and everybody was happy. So the next thing that um, I have in line is the limiter, but it's doing nothing. It's shaving a half dB of peaks on the loudest part of the song. It's literally might as well not be there. But, you know, uh, I learned um, halfway through the project when they heard the 67 version, it's like, we're going to get this master. And I was like, oh, they really like it. Um, so, because um, sometimes when you do stuff for YouTube, you know, it, it sounds good, it sounds great, everybody's happy. There's not an extra layer of scrutiny. Uh, but here there was an extra layer of scrutiny. They said, oh yeah, yeah, we're gonna get this master. I'm like, oh, okay, cool. Um, you like it, it's nice. Um, so that's it. So I, I said at the beginning that um, I was gonna take uh, questions. Tom, light of my life, do we have any questions? Bob has a comment. Which, which Bob? Oh no. Hi, Bob. Fair Child on the Bass, not the whole mix. Thank you, Bob. I'm sorry for not being uh, true to uh, the original thing, but it felt, this felt good for this particular exercise. But um, I really genuinely um, enjoyed all the feedback. And uh, again, if you, get, you guys who are on Pure Mix, go watch the video. It's, it's awesome. Um, comment from Bob Olsen. This is a good day. What else you got? Uh, no questions yet. No questions? I have a question. Okay, hit it. I know there's been the other one, and this one to a degree, you put the tape uh, like after the microphone thing versus in a dedicated tape slot. Why is that? Oh, because I wanted the tape after the modeling. Yes. I wanted to tape after the modeling. Um, and also, I don't know, just um, habit. Um, you know, whenever the, the DAWs, whenever the DAWs come in, like new DAW, right? Lawrence brand new DAW. I love it. But I have years of Pro Tools, Ableton, and Logic in my fingers. So when I work in Luna, some of my habits from the old, the other DAWs, um, come with me, right? And uh, fortunately, when you're a Pro Tools person, Luna just basically flows. Um, and uh, so that's cool. But, uh, you know, since there's no, I haven't had a tape slot up on top of the, of my channel strip before. And for years, I always put tape last to soften things. So the idea of putting tape first is not part of my consciousness yet. But, you know, it would, Probably uh, the more I work in Luna, the more it's going to happen that that I'm going to think, oh, just turn the tape on and everything. Actually, on other projects, also because when you have new DAW, you have new stuff, you try it. Uh, at least I try it. Um, then uh, they say, okay, that's cool. Let's try that. And then I have full mixes. I'm producing this band called uh, Party. I'm working with this band called Party. They're producing themselves. I'm um, helping. And uh, a lot, most of the stuff I do, I do in, in Luna, and I use the tape a lot. Um, so, uh, and I use the console too. They have a, a slot here. So you can add, uh, you know, an API uh, here, and you can add an API, an API 2500 on the, on the buses and an API vision channel strip on the, the, the console slot. Uh, I'm sure there will be more to come, um, but um, I think they have the Neve too. Uh, and um, and I use that when I'm my brain is 100% uh, in Luna for big projects. But for this one, since I had to keep it as pure as possible, I guess I reverted into my uh, comfortable mode from from uh, from before. Um, the only non-UA plugins here are uh, MixUp, which I use to deliver the records. So you can see here the, all the different versions. And uh, by the way, we could we could do something like this where we have this record here. People say I'm the 
life of the party girls, I'd tell a joke or two. That's the old, that's the 2022. Now, when we listen to the 2022, it didn't sound um, dark at all. It sounded, you know, fine. At least it sounded dark to, to Lewis. Uh, but to me, it sounded fine. Hello? Hello? Ha! Yeah. <laughs> I saw your text like that. Uh -huh. um, we have a guest. Ah, uh, yes. Your Majesty, you come with tea. I come with, I come bearing tea. Oh, that's beautiful. Let's yeah. find you a chair. Oh my God. Ladies Where? and gentlemen, um, uh, we're being graced by the illustrious presence of uh, Luis Quero. Hey, everybody. Come on in. Thanks, man. Um, here's a microphone. You heard, you've seen one of those before? I've, I've heard tell. They work things. great. They're, yeah? Yeah. They're, they're, pretty, they're, uh, they're helpful. Yes. In the, uh, to the end of communication. I yes, yes, I exactly, yes, exactly, exactly. Yes. Uh, yes. Nice. You, you're looking very African today. Thank you. That's nice. I, I'm in touch with my roots. Yeah. yeah Amazon, I guess. <laughs> <laughs> All right. So, are we good? Okay, cool. So, uh, ladies and gentlemen, Luis Quero. Um, so, I was, I was showing them the um the difference between the 2022 and the 1967 version oh, oh yeah it's nice oh. so so we started uh, and uh, and uh, i'll show you in a second when i show them so um so here's the uh 1967 version although i might be left in loud and hearty deep inside i'm blue so take a go and this is the uh, to 2022. I showed them earlier this thing. I, I showed them uh, your your feedback on the 2022 version, which was very polite. Yeah. <laughs> you, 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 you were very nice. Listen yeah. twice, all good, way better to my ears. Awesome, I'm good with that. You know? Yeah. So yeah. I was like, cool. <laughs> and then I showed yeah. them your feedback from the 67 version, which was, this is the vibe. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> this yeah. is fucking it. Woo! So, so, yeah. Um, <laughs> yeah. That yeah. says it all right there. <laughs> but the thing, is, the thing that's funny, and I trust, I trust they'll agree, um, is if you listen in comparison, this makes sense. And the 2022 sounds like, um, not as interesting and not as good. Yeah. Ha and um, however, when we were just listening to the 2022 version, without having listening to 67 version an hour ago when we started this madness, um, then it felt great. Yeah. Right. So, but I told them I could feel from the tone of your feedback that you were content but not happy. Mm -hmm. And I don't like that. Mm -hmm. So, um, this gets into the psychology element of, uh, of mixing, break. mixing records. Yes. Yeah. Uh, and producing records. Um, and so it, it really bothered me. Like I, I sat with it and Aww. I was like, I don't like this. This Aww. is not, this is, this is not how I like things to go. Aww. And, um, and so that's why the 60 ver 67 version is, is alive. And the thing that's funny is, um, the, the folks at UA, when I sent them to 2022, everybody's delighted. They started using it mm -hmm. um, for internal stuff. And also, they cut the video to it. Mm -hmm. And it, and fortunately, there were delays, and it was about to come out. And, and in the meantime, I, we did this, yeah. you know. And, and I feel that this is, this is, this is the vibe. Yeah. So um, enough about nerding out about plugins and stuff. Uh, if you have questions, you know, t tell Tom. But now I have questions for for. You have a question? There's a bunch. There's a bunch. So, but first, let's spend some time with Lewis because I'm sure Lewis has somewhere to be. <laughs> Unfortunately. Yes, I know you do. <laughs> um, so we're lucky enough that Lewis had a meeting down the street, like literally. Yeah. Um, so, um, do you remember? So, when I called you for this, uh, do you remember? like what your thought process was to make this version. Obviously, you went to listen to Smokey's version. Yeah. Or you well, already had it in your head. Well, oh gosh, the mic just fell off. That's okay. Gotcha. That's, that's extra sound effects. Stunts, there and you go. Back. Yes. Um, yeah, I think it will, the suggestion, if I remember correctly, came from uh, the, the folks at UA, right? The, the choice of the track? Yeah, I was, think you sent a few, and right. then and then they picked their favorite, which was this one. Yeah, so at that point where it was like, okay, this is the song. 
you know, my macro thought was, how does this work? And uh, how do I, I, you know, I do a lot of covers. Mm -hmm. uh, and right. one of my worlds and my first thought is, you know, the, the, at the most basic version, how do I, uh, what, is the, what does the version look like that is authentic to, both authentic to me and uh, reverent to the original? Yep. Um, and my first thought to that was sort of like, well, guitar. Mm -hmm. I should see what happens when me, guy with a guitar, uh, which is how I approach most of my songwriting, mm -hmm. see what happens, uh, what I can find there, you know? Yep. Uh, and I found sort of like a little vamp mm -hmm. uh, for the A section melody, like, yep. like you know, uh, one over three to the four, to the six minor to the five, mm -hmm. just, and... Uh, I, I kind of played with that for a while and found a way to voice it like with open strings on an electric. I mm -hmm. felt like that was like sort of like the hybrid, mm -hmm. of, like, finding the bridge, you know, between yep. those two macro sides. Yeah. Um, uh, found a chorus shortly thereafter. Yep. I wanted to reharm it just because. Uh, uh, I, I, I immediately I found that like. My, uh, I think I come from a little more of a gospel uh, thing, mm -hmm. uh, and that's a lot of inversions yep. and and like sort of like pointed motion harmonically. Mm -hmm. uh, whereas the original is just, it's like an epic statement of like, so take a good one chord. You know yeah. what I mean? It's like bold. You know what I yep. mean? So sort of like starting on a four is a little was kind of like my, I felt maybe a little yeah. more authentic to me bringing it into... It also gave it a, a more uh, reflective quality, that four chord on, on the first beat of the chorus. Yes, it was yeah, a, it makes yeah. it more introspective yeah. than yeah. like pro I, proclaiming. It's just like, it was more like, yeah. you know, I like, I, I like that. When you sent the demo, I was like, ah, this is nice. Ah, oh, thanks, man. Yeah, that, ah. I was like, oh, this is a nice touch. Ah. You know, and also... It's it's close enough to the original that it feels reverent. It feels like respectful. Yes. Uh, it's just basically an extension of it. It's a it's a different. It's a slightly different uh, top coat. Yes. Yeah. Yes. Totally. 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 Very nice. Thanks, man. That's that's an awesome move. And so for the so for the horns for the horn section. Yeah. Um, when how how did that come together? Uh, I did the horn arrangement as I often do horn arrangements, which is me playing mouth horns mm -hmm. uh, into a microphone. <laughs> you know, mm, and yeah. then l l layer it. And, uh -huh. and uh, <laughs> the poor horn players, you know, they have, <laughs> that's what they have to learn. But you're a trumpet player. So, yeah, I'm a brass player as yeah, well. So you know, you know, you know how it should be. And uh, it should yeah. sit. That's uh, why it's playable. Yes, exactly. yes. And they learn it exactly. Yeah, they learned exactly. I, you know, I recorded the demo mm -hmm. with my mouth horns, and you know, so I, and I'm, you know, I'm working in Luna. Mm -hmm. Yeah. And uh, and so, I just, you know, I separated the tracks out to mm -hmm. send to them to, to to catch their parts individually. Alfonso Horn his, mm -hmm. uh, and uh, on trumpet, and James Casey on saxophone, mm -hmm. uh, and they learned it exactly and brought it to life. Cool. Awesome. Um, so the rest of the band is people you work with a lot, right? Yeah, Joe Saylor. Uh -huh. uh, Joe Saylor is drummer. Joe Saylor is the drummer uh, with me on the Late Show with Stephen Colbert, and uh, also the longtime drummer of uh, my brother and predecessor John Baptiste. Mm -hmm. uh, and uh, he's just someone that I trust uh, with music. Yeah, you yeah. know, he's not necessarily like a like a studio gun for hire type because he has something to say and he brings a perspective. Mm -hmm. But I know that uh, with Joe, the most important thing for him is always the, the music yeah. and it's the song. And yeah. it's always more above anything, above himself even. Yeah. So with his combination of craft and mm -hmm. care, that's just like, I, knew, I, I, had, I felt that doing a Motown sort of tribute Mm -hmm. Track, I felt like I could trust. Yeah, him with I mean, that. you can tell from the the, the pickup, pick, 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 yeah, you're like, oof, there. Yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah. He learned, and he learned, and he he took it exactly from my demo. 
Okay. And 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 just applied his his thing craft. That's to it. beautiful. Yeah. And who was a bass? I forget his name. Uh, Fema Efron. Okay. His bass player is bass player. Yeah. One of my all-time favorites. Yeah, he's yeah. great. Yeah. Um, and actually, on the final mix, uh, there's it's just him playing. There's no compressor. There's nothing. It's just a tape, and that's it. Really? Yeah. There was no compression. There was no basically no processing. Dude, uh, his his sound is. It's, it's really a, a beautiful thing to, to get inside of. I hope you, did you guys get into the nitty gritty of it? Uh, I'm, I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to play, we can play it. We're here, let's, yeah. let's, let's check it out. This is just what comes from his fingers. Like no matter what. Yeah. when he gets he gets uh, excited here about his bass playing is like he's he can do he understands that thing of like like, like the where the bass player is another bass drum uh-huh yeah and i mean and it's it's a very nuanced thing yeah, that a lot of great. bass players don't, don't don't really understand enough to be able to get inside of mm -hmm. uh but you know like if you put a back beat to that like yeah. it's like that's, that's it a, that's a whole track that's the record yeah I mean? and um i um if I remember well, I tracked this with a DI, but I put a um, uh, I put a 610 preamp on it to drive it, because mm -hmm. a lot of the the Jameson stuff distorts like crazy. Oh yeah, I remember you. I saw yeah. you showed me you, but yeah, you had yeah. the 610 on yeah. there. Yeah. yeah, yeah. So I put the 610 on to get a little bit of that. Otherwise, yeah. it just sounded like the bass was coming from a different planet, mm -hmm. and then putting a little bit so of edge it on in it. That yeah. World. yeah. So now it sounds like a, a big pissed off bassoon basically <laughs> which is great uh and um and i felt it worked great and it works great in the track like i literally had nothing to do wow when i put it in the track which wow. was, was kind of cool wow. um yeah and then uh that organ player is awesome and he was really kind because he's, he had never played organ with a plugin before yeah um so we yeah. were actually running like the midi to my laptop yeah that... and then running back to him uh and he did a great job and he used a we used a, a program the uh the sliders and the controller mm -hmm. so that he could have the draw bars mm -hmm. and he did a, a fantastic job it, it sounds really cool it sounds really yeah, that's Corey Bernhardt also of the late show band you basically brought the Colbert yeah, band kind here of brought yeah. half the band yeah. okay cool that's awesome <laughs> Very nice, and you know, there's something you haven't heard because we haven't geeked out. Because... Are you? What is that running through one of the reverbs? Yeah, so that's what I was going to show. Um, so this is the, the record. Louis has. You have heard this, but he hasn't. So let's do it again. Um, so this is the record, and then I'm just going to mute the plate. There's one plate. There's yeah. uh, there's a little plate on the organ, but it's just there for decoration. It's just to push it back a little bit. Yeah. It, it's got no tail, but the only tail comes from here. Today, this is the record with the tape, and then I'm just going to mute the tape. People say I'm the life of the party Cause I tell a joke or two Although I might be laughing loud and hearty So as I said earlier, the, the plate makes the record. Oh, yeah. It's, it's incredible. Yeah. Like um, These days, except for certain types of music, um, the, um, the gear is less crucial than it used to be because their limitations were such, right? Mm -hmm. They had one reverb in the studio. Yeah. That was it. Now we have, we could have 10 reverbs per track if we want to. Uh, we could have 10 compressors per track. Some people do that, don't do that. But some people do that. Um, but at the time, they, they may have had one or two compressors. Um, they had the, maybe they have an EQ on the console. Right. Motown, they had this guy, the Hitsville EQ thing. But I don't, yeah. I don't think they had 12 of them. 
uh, or too many of them. And then they had one, one, um, they have one chamber because it was their attic. They only had so many attics, you know yeah. what I mean? So um, those limitations help create the sound. And today, there are no limitations. So you get no, no help from the equipment to create the sound. And um, I think it's changing the relationship to, to music. And it's, yeah. it's putting oh, actually, in, in a very perverse way, uh, I think it's pulling, putting the onus on the musicians even more. Yeah. On the producer and on the mixer and on the engineer even more because the job is to narrow down an infinite possibility as opposed to exploit a very, um, you know, super exploit a very limited range of options. Yeah. Now we have to narrow it down. Yeah. It's a very different brain and yeah. it creates a very different result. Yeah. Me thinks. Yeah, um, me thinks as well. Yes. Um, so that's it. That's the, um, that's the, that's the, that's the one that, um, the version that went final. And wow, that, 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 it sounds so good. It's very nice. Sounds so good. It's wonderful. So, Th Thomas, how, how much time do you have? You got to go. I'm, I'm good for another like 20 minutes. <laughs> Royal. Your Majesty back there. Yeah. Is there a question for Louis? Uh, yeah, there was one question for Here we go. Is there a camera I should be looking at or something? This is A. Hi. This is B. And I. <laughs> You've seen a camera before? I've, I've heard yeah. tell. Yeah, yeah. When you look into it, <laughs> there's people on the other side. It's amazing. <laughs> Salute. <laughs> What's the question? Uh, the question is, will it change anything of your singing or the way you work after the experience of music? You know, I did learn a lot about a lot, by just by listening to... I was really impressed by the, uh, and impacted by the, the way that the microphone takes the two mm -hmm. sides. Yeah, you know, the modeling thing. The yeah. modeling and yeah. watching you switch like the cardioid yeah. pattern. Yeah. That was like, oh wow. It, I, it actually, I was going, I, if I remember correctly, it, I was still in the process of finishing this newest record that's coming out mm -hmm. in the next couple of months. Mm -hmm. uh, uh, and it definitely affected my my vocal performances on my record, just for the fact of hearing uh, how it translated, uh, just instantly having that instant feedback of like this is how it translates in this pattern and this mm -hmm. mic, this, mm -hmm. this you know, um, and I ended up doing it mostly on a on a sixty seven. Mm -hmm. uh, this is a BP sixty seven. Yeah. 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 Because that's, that's the one that's perfect for you. Yeah. Yeah. We had Fab yeah. and I had this conversation. Yeah. Yeah, uh, I had the same thing. I, ju I was just saying, it's like I had never tried to figure out pattern in the booth because I never had the time. Because there's always some other more important thing that happens. You put the cardio on, it sounds good. You know you can fix it later yes. if it's not. Yes. And so having this, I was able to switch to figure out. So it actually, this has actually changed something for me. It's like now I know that if I have the, this feeling in the back of my head that's like, ah, this may not be as good as possible, it's fine, or it's good, it's very good, mm -hmm. but I have this, you know, you have this little feeling here and you're like, ah, I don't know. Mm -hmm. Then I know that this experience, whether I use these microphones or any other microphone, I know that if I have this feeling, I'm right. Yeah. And then yeah. I should go an another extra mile if the situation allows yes and often it doesn't like for for this if we had been working with my collection of vintage microphones you would have been in cardio because it was madness to get all this shit together at that speed with the video people and you know everything and the clock ticking and everything so i would yeah. have just put the microphones where i put the microphones usually uh made sure nothing was broken make sure everything was in the ballpark and moved on mm -hmm. uh with this i was able to um refine post but it, it it taught me a lot in in what the years i've done to my workflow wow so it basically my workflow fell into um not a routine but more a a set of of, of understanding mm -hmm. and that i followed um because of pressure yeah and but then having the, also yeah. to trust that little well yeah and and i know you're like you're mixing you're like uh you're you're tracking you're like uh this yeah this is this is gonna be this is gonna take extra time later mm -hmm. but you know you gotta go to the show or um mm -hmm. or you know whatever somebody's gotta catch a plane or somebody showed up three hours late because uh new york traffic whatever yeah. and so those are the parameters yeah and uh and and 
And something that a lot of people, I had this conversation recently, actually, uh, last night. A lot of people think that in, in the, um, at this level of musicianship and this level of, say, you know, in the professional realm, you know, we do session until six in the morning and time is no object. That's not how it works. Uh, no. No, no, no. <laughs> it's, it's, it's not a day job, but it's definitely like you show up at 10 and the session wraps at six and it is what it is. Yeah. And, and, and the things that go over are complicated because we have things like, you know, children. Yes. Human uh, beings. Other human beings yeah. or, or, uh, or, or, or burnout. Yeah, or people people burn out. People work like, insane stream of emails. Seven hundred. Right. So people yeah. people um, in in the uh, at least in New York. I don't know about the other cities in this. In, I know it's like this in Nashville, mm -hmm. but it's like there's a call time and there's an end time, mm -hmm. and right. um, and so we have to get it done within that time. And there's not really a lot of redo. It's like it, the the session is the session because of costs also. Yeah, you know it's expensive to get a band like this together because they're badass, and if they're badass, they cost money. Yeah. Um, so yeah. Thanks. So that was good for me, and apparently it did the same thing for you. Now you yeah. you can tweet. Yeah, it's good. Yeah. That was a very I, I, that was a big surprise for me. Yeah. Uh, I liked it. I me it. too. Yeah. Right. Yeah. Yes. Thomas. Oh. Ah, oh, uh, that's thanks nice. So much. Well, if we can somehow manage to get Lewis, um, we will do more. Oh, I'm, I can't wait. So, if you want to catch more of Lewis, I strongly recommend you go on Instagram. You heard of it? That's the one on the internet. Um, <laughs> the internet is the one that has email. Is that one? Um, and every Monday, most Mondays, 98% of all Mondays, Lewis releases a absolutely surreal cover. It's called Keto Covers. C no. It is yeah. not, yeah. C A T O covers. It's an ah. It's awesome. It's um. It's uh. I don't. I don't really do social media that much, uh, but I go see that every Monday. Ah. It's really awesome, and it's Lewis playing drums and bass and guitar and whatever else is available at that moment, and singing and doing a very smart uh, and very heartfelt cover of a song that you know but you haven't heard in that shape. And sometimes he has really awesome guests too. It's a good place to be. That's, that's all. So until we can catch uh, Lewis on Pure Mix again, um, that's where you can catch Lewis. You can also catch Lewis every night um, on the Stephen Colbert show because he took over for John Baptiste as the band leader. Yeah, that's right. That is true. What else you got, boss? Week, weeknights at 11.35. 11.35. Week, thir my, yeah. that's past my bedtime. Eastern time. Oh, yeah. Uh, some of this ties into what you were just talking about, with how much did Mike position in the modeling it was all of it. Uh, the question was, how much did the the the, uh, the patterns of the mic modeling help in using less EQ? It is 100% the reason why I was able to do this, get to this sound without EQ. That and the tape. Obviously, you heard the tape, but I would say so. Did you talk the, about the like the distance? Yeah. Distance of, the, of, of the vocal lead yeah. vocal mic. Yeah. Oh yeah. No, we didn't talk about that. Um, let's let's talk about that. But so let me rephrase. Not 100%. 78.3%. <laughs> The other percentage is the tape. But the fact that I could pick the microphone post, basically play Al Schmidt by putting a microphone and then replacing his uh, 60 years of record making by clicking on buttons and saying, oh, I like this one. Oh, I like this one. Like I was able to change the tambourine from a 4038 to, I think, a 67 in the, wow. in the mixing. That changed wow. everything. I, wow. Basically, the, the microphone is the EQ, which is what Al used to say. Um, so yeah, it's that much. What Lewis was talking about is, um, that's also something that uh, I believe, I, a question I had as Bob Olson and Dave Isaac, the uh, original, some original Motown engineers who you know I consulted with to make mm -hmm. sure I didn't do anything too stupid. Mm -hmm. um, mm -hmm. uh, I asked them how far away from the microphone, um, because a lot of those uh, vocals were overdubbed. They were not sung live. Mm -hmm. This one was song live. Um, but uh, I said, you know, was it like this close? Or was it this close? And they both said, you know, there was a, it varied depending on the performer and everything, but there was distance. Like, there was distance. Wow. And then I looked at pictures and I tried to figure out which pictures were real and which pictures were for, you know, promo. Yes. And just I, I look also at old Frank pictures 
and uh, Al showed me some Frank pictures he had that he knew were real or that he was on the session and literally this far away. And I'm like, you know what, let's just do it. And it's scary. Yeah. Because we used to, I mean, I don't do that anymore, but for the longest time, this is what you see. Yeah. In and all the hip hop videos. Yeah. Yeah. Like, no, I feel like modern practice has been like, that you're, when you're getting, when you're doing game stage and you're trying to find what's the closest yeah. you can be to capture like the most yeah. in your face thing. And then we were just like, what's the, kind of like, what's the far farthest? Way, how far we can, can we be? Without like, yeah. you know. It, act, it acted as a natural compressor. Yeah, exactly. Uh, it also was closer to the spirit of the sound of the time, yeah. and uh, and allowed it to allow me to get the tone I wanted without EQ and made it more more together. Um, it's quite special, you know. I can say with absolute certainty that if you have a way to control your acoustic environment better than in our booth, our booth, the booth is a is a compromise always unless it's big, because. It's designed to keep sound out. It's not designed to sound good. It sounds mm -hmm. as good as it can, mm -hmm. and we're lucky our sounds really good, as yeah. you can hear. But I would have loved to be able to have you in a wide open room. I mm -hmm. would have gotten even an even better sound, wow. um, and even less guitar string click yes, click yeah, click, yeah, you yeah. know, feed, um, bleed. Mm -hmm. But if you can control your um, your acoustic environment, yeah, you can absolutely put the microphone. Uh, two feet away and get and people will feel you're literally eating the microphone if you don't have the reflections and then you don't have to use half as much EQ or half as much compression wow. on the, the la on the next David Crosby record um, that is not out yet but that we did before he passed uh, literally cross was I said cross how long is your arm and I said if you if you can touch the microphone with your arm out we good. So it was this far away from the microphone. And then wow. I pushed it back in a little bit. And uh, wow. Becca, Becca and Michelle and, and Michael were that far away too. And it gives this like y uh, close yet far. So it gives it a more, uh, it's more like a Hollywood movie than the documentary to me. Yeah. And I just love that sound. You should have been in the room when I did that the first time and Cross, and I was with Cross in the live room and I said, Okay, Cross, this is this is where I want you. And he looked at me and said, Fish lips, he called me fish lips. Um, <laughs> oh, that's, that's it's nice, yeah. yeah. <laughs> Tumman and Yemen. He said, Fish lips, this is never gonna work. And I'm like, Cross, just please, just <laughs> sing. <laughs> and um, and he's like, Fuck this, this is never gonna work. You just this is horrible. You just you have no idea what you're doing. I've been doing this for 67 years. And I was like, I know, I know, Cross, I know. Just just try it once. <laughs> And then he came to the control room, and I just pushed the fader, and I played it, and he looked at me, and he said, fuck you, fish lips, and then he went back and sang again. Uh, <laughs> that was awesome. <laughs> and so, and that, that was a bet, and this is something wow. that I, I wow. discovered over time, is like, if you have the right acoustics, yes, you can be, I mean, you, you don't put it, you know, on the other side of the room, but you don't have to kill that capsule. Yeah, you know. Yeah, and That's especially you're singer, like you're very dynamic. I was just about to say, yeah. it makes me think, like, because as a singer, you perform differently depending on how close you are to the mic yeah. and how well you hear yourself. Yep. You know, when you hear more nuance, like being it up in your face, like, mm -hmm. at least for me, I think, I think it's safe to say, like, if you're an in tune uh, a singer, self aware, like you, you respond to that. Yep. You know, what I mean, in your performance, like. If, if I hear the nuance, then I dig into the nuance, mm -hmm. like, or that becomes a tool on the palette for that. Yeah, you know, for and that, if you sing vocal. super close, if you sing, what I've noticed is that if you sing super close, yeah, everything is magnified. It's deceiving. Yeah, and so what happens is like you don't you don't do take as much risk because yeah. the dynamics get crazy. Yeah, and so you don't have as much range. You can't do as much. Yeah. at least that's been working. No, it doesn't work for everything. Yeah. you know, it depends on the singer. But for singers like you or Michelle Willis, or Crosby, uh, or Becky Stevens, or, or, or people who really know and who are truly instrumentalists of the voice, uh, then it's been working pretty good for me. Wow. Um, and so I'm glad you, you found out. And with the model, you can actually taste, uh, test that a little bit with the proximity effect. Um, so you can remove the proximity effect, or you can add back proximity effect even if you're a foot and a half away. Wow. This is very interesting. Wow. Um, so I haven't done, I've been doing almost all mixing since we did this. 
Yeah. I haven't um, I haven't been doing any tracking, but I'm going to start tracking again uh, this summer, and so I'm going to absolutely going to try more of those tricks. It's great, Thomas. Sure. Uh, we'll just keep for one. <laughs> okay. How do you get the louder level for YouTube without using any limiting? Well, YouTube is normalized at minus 14, um, uh, LUFS, average, over the course of the program. So it's not that hard to get to that level. As you saw, I had a limiter. Um, and the fact that I wasn't raising the ceiling of the limiter uh, doesn't mean that, I mean, we could see here, if you, if you show decibel right here, you could see that my average uh, true dy the average dynamic range of, uh, across the whole song was 12.8 uh, dBs, which means I'm actually already louder if you look at it in these terms because there's only 12.8 dBs of uh, dynamic. Um, that means I'm already uh, more compressed than the amount of range that YouTube will give you, which means I'm well within um, that. I don't know what... Um, I didn't read the levels. I didn't geek out and read the levels of the master, but I'm sure that the person who mastered this after uh, probably use a limiter and, and put it somewhere. But uh, little known fact, uh, since um, Spotify and um, YouTube are the loudest, because Apple Music is minus 16, titles are minus 16. So if you shoot for minus 14 and you keep your dynamic range, uh, minus 14 average dynamic range under minus 14, like 13 dBs, because there's also a 1 dB of uh, true peak thing, but let's not be detail oriented. If you if you're in the, <laughs> which is why this is at twelve point eight, mm. um, but if you stay within this range, and you don't have to impress any A and R, uh, girlfriend or um, you know whatever your dog by having the loudest song on earth, uh, and you deliver your file and your mix is good, it will sit just fine. Mm. Um, at minus fourteen on YouTube. You don't have to jack it up. It's a question of average across the whole song. So that's always going to be minus 14. That's why the algorithm dies. But for example, if you have a very long intro that's fairly quiet and a very long outro that's fairly quiet, and you have 30 seconds of thrash metal in the middle, um, when you play the very long intro, so that's going to average over time, right? Which yeah. means that. The quiet part, I'm going to bring the average down, and the loud part, I'm going to bring it back up. Yeah. So now, if you're going to play, say, a, a, a record that has that's more nuanced, that's more even, um, it's going to be always around minus 14. So if you play the minus 14 part, and then you compare your record, the quiet part may be at minus 16. Yours is going to, that part is going to feel quieter. Mm. But then you switch to the loud part of your record, and it's going to literally make your eyes bleed. Because, because it's it, so it, incredibly it, it, it loud. Average, yeah. yeah. Um, so it's very difficult to, to really wrap your head around that. What I recommend people do is make the best sounding record you can and make sure it fits in 14, 13 dBs of dynamic the way you like it. And then you're good. Mm. Yeah. And then if you need to make a version that is uh, that an elephant sat on, <laughs> Uh, so you can deliver it to your uh, music supervisor so that it's as loud as whatever, uh, you know, meter music. Th dude, that's fine. But overall, just make it sound good. It'll be fine. Amen. Yeah. Get another one, boss? Sure. Uh, could you use the capital fingers instead of the middle fingers? Yeah, we could do that. It would sound completely different, though. So, uh, let's see. People say I'm the life of the... So that's the Hitsville. And this is the Capitol Chambers. I'm going to mute the Hitsville. We're going to use number four because, because Al. That was Al's favorite. So this is the one that's by default. People say I'm... Oh, that happened. I think we crashed the live stream. People say... Amazing. Oh, yeah. That happened. People say I'm the life of the party girl. I think my computer just crashed.
uh, or the live stream crash, or something is not happening. It's, the, the vocal still sounds like it's fine. It's yeah. Like it's just a yeah. I don't. I don't know what happened here. Let's maybe see. It's, maybe it's a problem. People say. The, this, it's not the capital, it's something crash. People say I'm the life of the pop. Yeah, baby. Yeah, the bass. There you go. Life of the pop. Gotta love technology. Oh, yeah. uh, here's the capital chambers. Enable. Turn it on. Works better on. People say I'm the life of the party Cause I tell a joke or two Although I might be left It's nice. It's, it is nice. I, I, I like it. Uh, hold on, hold on. This is a good question. Thank you. Yeah. Uh, hold on. Uh, so, this is the Hitsville? People say I'm the life of the party Cause I tell a joke or two and this is the capital. People say I'm the life of the party cause I tell a joke or two. So obviously it's a little softer. I'm yeah. gonna I'm gonna compensate. People say I'm the life of the party cause I tell a joke or two. Although I might be laughing loud and hearty deep inside I'm Oh, it's so good. And wow. then this is the uh, chamber, the Hitsville. People say I'm the life of the party cuz I tell a joke or two. I, I kind of always I kind of always feel like the uh, the capital chambers is is really good with like subtleties. Yes. Like whereas the Hitsville is like if you if you want to lean into that thing and yeah. that's what you want to do, yeah, it is there for it's you. A, it's a time machine. It's a uh, yeah. It'll capital put you is in that place. it's like a a bulb. Yeah. Uh, yeah. But that, that's a good question. You know, I didn't even think of it, but uh, that's cool. It works both ways. But this one, the the Hitsville chamber just brings you there. Yeah. Yeah. Um, it puts you, it'll put you in the world. Like, yes. In, yeah. like, and that's because we have you know sixty years or uh, seven years of listening to that stuff. Yeah, is that wild? So wild. It's dude. wild. It's amazing. It's wild. It's wild. All right, it is. You have to go, dude. I have about one minute. Yeah. One minute. That's not a few, small amount of minutes. Small amount. Small, small, okay. small so, step for mankind. Dude. Okay. So I think this is a, a good time to wrap this. Um, so uh, thank you so much for watching. Thanks, Louis, for coming by after Thanks the meeting. Thanks for having yeah. me, dude. Thanks for producing uh, this incredible experience that was fun that was yeah. fun we should do that again we should do uh, that again we might do that again might do um that again. thank you so much for watching and um thanks to universal audio for uh, making this possible um because it's not easy to pull these things together mm -hmm. um and uh, again if this is interesting to you there is a making of the tracking session with all the gritty detail on puremix.com and oh yeah i'm supposed to tell you subscribe and like and uh, yeah, yeah, yeah do that stuff. that stuff yeah, yeah. okay thank you very much <laughs> ciao